What's the new concept, by the way? Oh, it's another Izakaya. Um, wow. Cool. Yeah. So, have you been a royal? Dude, t- my first time ever in Philly, which I didn't realize it, was when I went to the chef conference. Uh-huh. And we went to, like, two places that I didn't even, you know, pick some, you know, some of my team picked. So, I've been to, like, two restaurants in Philly. Um, but I was looking at your menu, and I was like, fuck, man, I really want to go to this place. <laughs> my wife and I actually might do a date night. Yeah. In a week or two and just go, because, you know, it's not that far to Philly and just go to Philly and grab a hotel room. But no, I haven't been yet. Yeah. So there's, there's two parts. There's a duality to it. There's an Izakaya. And yeah. once you go past the Northern Curtains, there's a Omakase, yeah. but it's very integrated together, um, which is what I like. But the new concept, the new Izakaya is, is a little bigger. And um, it it won't have any sushi, so that's the main difference. Oh, so just the izakaya, not the omakase in the back. Yeah, so it'll have more cooked items, more. Yeah, there, there there'll still be some like raw dishes. Um, yep, but no sushi rice, which is a big factor. So no rolls, yeah. no chirashi, no like you know stuff like that. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah, that's. I mean, we're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit about that about <laughs> that today. Um, but by the way, I I, I did want to ask you. I mean, I know you you went to Rutgers. Yeah, and got a marketing degree. And um, I, I love that, you know, the walking past the izakaya into the omakase. I, have you ever been to, well, it's not, it actually, it's not open anymore, but there's a place called Angel Share yeah. in New York City. In Village you know, you would like have to yeah. walk through the izakaya to get to the speakeasy bar. Uh-huh. <laughs> and uh, it's the first thing I thought of when I was looking at, you know, Jerush was like, oh, that's such, I fucking love that. I love that idea. It's such like a cool, like, you know, it's almost got like PDT vibe of like, you know, you go into the, the phone booth and you get into the bar. Um, was that the original, when you first opened, did you have that? premise right away yeah i, I remember the in, yeah the original like the initial conversations with my partners which was when i was like i think 24 25 when we we're talking about like, it and, <laughs> i know and i wanted to um i want we we had uh we have a brick facade on the front of our building and we were discussing like how much money it's going to be to make it nicer mm-hmm. um like you know put some like either antique brick or something right um and I was just like, you know, let's, why don't we just keep it as is and just throw a lantern up. And it's kind of like, you either know, or you don't know, you walk past, it's very nondescript. And the first couple of years, I'll never forget people. And even now it still happens. People are standing outside, not sure if that's a restaurant. <laughs> yeah. I love brick though, man. My first restaurant that I opened in Brooklyn, it was um, drywall. And then we ripped off the drywall and we realized it was all brick. Yeah. And like we, I mean, we didn't, we didn't have a ton of money to open. So we, my partner and I, we point like cleaned and pointed all the brick and then just painted it white and white brick is like really sick. It's such a good material. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, anyways, I think what was super interesting that I learned. So you worked with your dad for a very long time. Um, and I want to know what that was like just growing up working for your dad in a restaurant. And then he started working, you know, working with you at this restaurant. So maybe to start though, like, what was it like working for your dad at Fuji for, I mean, I think you started when you were like 14, right? I started um, at 14, yeah. All the way up to making sushi, which by the way, it's like, I know it's super hard to even get an apprenticeship to make sushi. Um, so that must've been pretty amazing and serendipitous that you're able to, to do that. Like, what was it like working for him? Well, I mean... Besides him being this old Japanese chef, I guess he wasn't that old when we started learning. But what does that mean? Like, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's Japanese culture. It's just, it's very, it's very intense, and it's, 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 um, you know, you get like punished almost for when you make mistakes. <laughs> I'm sure it's the <laughs> same really with French good. in French kitchens. Like, it's it's old school yeah. cooking. It's old school kitchen. Um, mm-hmm. it's all about precision and and methodology and philosophy and and yeah you're working with really expensive ingredients so if you mess up it's a big deal um so you have to do the same thing over and over again for years like washing rice and cutting vegetables um or making tamago but um beyond that he's my dad so there's all that that it's layered into that because there's resentments and there's (laughs) you know yeah you're you're more you're more comfortable with each other to I could talk back because I'm his son. It's it's a little different, right? Um, but it it was good at the end of it because you know he can't he couldn't fire me and I couldn't walk out. 
And there yeah. were moments where we definitely got to that point. It was, it's really hard. Um, but, that dynamic must be really difficult. I mean, I, I, I can't imagine like, you know, I, I come from those kinds of kitchens where you get plates thrown at you and, you know, yelled at and, and, um, and, um, the idea that that person doing that is your dad <laughs> and you don't really have a choice adds this whole other layer to it that must have been, um, I mean, even as a, as a kid, must have been pretty difficult. Yeah, it was intense. But also there, there's a whole nother part. Like when he brought me on at 14, I was a dishwasher and that was when my parents like officially got divorced. Yeah. And he wasn't at the house anymore. So I think a large part of it was he wanted to see me more. Yeah. Um, so did it, he say it, that to you? Hmm? Did he ever say that to you that that was something no? But it, it just like the timing, like it made sense. Yeah. Like all of a sudden, I had to go work one day a week, or I was offered the job. I forget if it was a choice or not, but yeah, I had to go work <laughs> one day a week, <laughs> starting at fourteen, and then it started from there. Um, so it was a good way to you know spend time again, but it's a lot of time, and it's and. In that environment, my mom was there too. So they were divorced, owning wow. that restaurant. That's nuts. I know it was nuts. Uh, th there were definitely some hard times, but you know we got through it, and I learned a lot. Jeez. So, well, I mean, what are the biggest takeaways that you? I mean, you obviously now you have your own restaurant, so it's not like you worked in your dad's, you know, restaurant and then started a different kind of business. You literally. It's pretty linear. Uh, what, what, yeah. Like, what, what are the biggest takeaways that you're that you're sort of like using today? Yeah, I mean, to to start to frame it, it, it was a small Japanese BYO, and you know, Royal Sushi Nezukaya is not a very small restaurant. You know, we seat about seventy people, and we have a ton of alcohol. <laughs> you know, we have a booming bar program. Um, so one of the big takeaways was that you know, when, when you open a restaurant or a business, it's got to, the business plan has to be bigger, like bigger thinking of what's going to happen later. Cause when it came time, when I started getting approached to open Royal, my parents, they, they could still do the job and they were still relatively young, but there was a thought in my mind of like, what's going to happen? Cause I could see it just getting really hard. Um, and I just saw if I stayed there, what, you know, what am I going to do? Am I just, am I going to step in my dad's, you know, my shoes and take care and run the restaurant like he had run for all these decades, or am I going to do my own thing there, which I feel like was harder. So it's really about being very business oriented and, and kind of having a game plan of how the financial like strategy of a business, right. From the, from the get go, because there, there are times where like, I think we're poor. I don't remember. Like not poor, but you know, yeah, we're definitely yeah. hurting. It was a small restaurant. And there were, you know, especially during like 2008 crisis, like the 2008, 2009, 2010, it was really hard. I'll, I'll never forget. And, um, I just, I just wanted to avoid things like that or just having such a small restaurant where we had to work all the time. We yeah. were open. Every Thanksgiving, every Christmas, it was just me, my mom, and my dad on some of those like holidays. Jeez. We worked six days a week. My dad worked every day because he went in on the Monday. We're closed to like prep more. Mm -hmm. There was no, there was no way to not work. There's yeah. no flexibility because it's so small. So, you know, our restaurant with the way we staff, we we can fortunately there's some flexibility. Built yeah, in. it's so funny. I was just talking to someone today who has a really great bakery and we were having this conversation about, well, you know, I just want to try and figure out how to, um, have one more day off where I can spend with my kids. And it is a tough, like hump to get over when you have a business to think I'm going to need to spend some more money and figure out some more top line so that I can actually step back. And I feel like, yeah, I'm assuming, you know, with your parents, there's that like level of, you know, um, I don't know if it's fear or, you know, trepidation of like, no, this is what we do. And it just means we have to work all the time. It sounds like you, you took that away from them of like, mm, maybe there's a little bit more we can do. Yeah. I mean, I still have that old school mentality ingrained in me. I mean, they're both immigrants. They came here and they opened a restaurant and they've worked their ass off to get, 
you know, to support me and my sister. And I'm extremely appreciative of them working with them. I saw it every day and that's built, that grit is built into me. And that, and I needed that to open Royal. I definitely did, but we're eight years in the Royal now and, you know, businesses evolve and you need to, it can't be like that forever. It's not sustainable. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I do agree. I think it has to be like that for a while. It does. You know, for it to really work, you have to really, I mean, any restaurant that's going zero to one, like it's just a grind for a long time. And then y you do have to have some sort of, you know, light at the end tunnel of like, once it's proven that it works as a concept that you start to, you know, um, be able to figure out ways to step back. But yeah, there is no way around it. And I think um, it's an attribute that anybody, I don't know if you agree, like if you start a restaurant, if you think you're just gonna, you know, um, figure out ways to scale day one and just chill, not chill, but like even just work normal hours. It's just not a thing. Yeah. Like if, I mean, you always hear about it. Someone's like, oh, someone wants to retire and open a restaurant and you're just like, that's <laughs> not, that's the opposite of retirement. Yeah. That is like going back to work times a hundred. Um, yeah, you, I mean, I, I say these things that where it's nice to like kind of find some flexibility of time to go away but at the same time what i have also learned of just owning a restaurant is you you have to accept that you are always going to work like if you're ever short staffed or you need to train someone like you have to work or and it also empowers you like you you being the chef owner i'm i i can't be tied to someone like having to be there right if someone yeah can't like either has to leave or they you know, for some for whatever reason like I can't be tied to that and it's it's really important that I can always step in and yeah. I, I can always like train up people or you know fill in at least temporarily for one position um you need to be able to do that in a restaurant is your dad still working with you today yeah he's still there he, he works like limited hours and he comes he actually makes a tamagoyaki <laughs> every morning yeah i saw yeah. the head what's it like working with your dad now i mean now that it's, it's not that it's not that the tables are turned but um you know it's it's certainly a different dynamic yeah i mean he we've all changed over these eight years i do have to say for for the better um and he he's just he's much happier these days he has no stress he's no like anxiety about the business he actually he doesn't really know I don't really tell him any of the issues going on. Like, mm -hmm. you know, there's always something going on. Yeah. Um, he, he doesn't hear any of that. So he's just like completely stress-free. Um, he comes in, he like, you know, does a couple things for a couple hours and then he goes home. He doesn't stay all the whole service and he's not there most nights. Um, that's great. But, I mean, it must be I mean, almost like a dream for him, you know, cause he still gets to do like <laughs> the thing that he loves, but he's not tied to the, to the, to the other part of the, of the operation. Yeah. He, I mean, it took him time to adjust because he used to be the main star of the show. Right. Yeah. And the only way to be able to do this is where you're not right. If you can, if you can leave at any time, you're not doing the omakase. You're not like, you know, yeah. running the menu. You're not training people every day. Um, but he still, you know, inputs his wisdom where he can with some of our, you know, long, young chefs and, yep. um, I can see that he enjoys it and he enjoys his time away, but it, it was hard. I could, I knew it was hard for him to adjust to, to enjoy the time away. Right. Cause if you've been working your whole life every day with no time to yourself, like you have to learn how to, yeah live outside of work yeah it's really but once hard. he did he, he's he's happy he's ready to go he's like all right i'm leaving bye i'm gonna yeah. go tend to my gardens or see my grandkids or <laughs> it's funny that that you know when, you, when you're working 100 hour weeks every week for years i don't know you know about you but i, I remember times where like i would have like uh you know a day off or like god forbid maybe more than a day off and it it's almost like that feeling you know if you if you I mean, this is a terrible analogy, actually, just like when you get out of prison, but like, I'm like, what do I do? I don't know. I'm going to, I'll go stash somewhere, I guess, because <laughs> I don't know what to do with my, with my time on my day off, because all I know is, is working all the time. It does. It's like a, you have to learn how to, um, well, how to like 
live and enjoy things again when you're working that much all the time. Yeah. I mean, I feel like, so we were talking about that grit and like that, that like entrepreneurial, just you have to crush it when you open, you just have to work all the time and it takes, it's hard to turn that off when you don't need it. Right. And like you just said, there are moments where you have downtime and you're just fidgeting. You're just like organizing things. You're just looking at your calendar, filling it up more. And, it, and you're just, you just, you feel useless when you're not doing. And that's been the biggest thing for me to learn how to adjust for that when I don't have to do things. But for the most part, I'm still like that. I mean, even my days off, I'm organizing, I'm cleaning, I'm, I don't stop, but I can if I need to. And it's taken yeah. a long time to do that. And I'm sure you've, you know, faced the same thing. Yeah, it's, I, I still have this problem, I mean, even though like, I don't really, you know, you know do anything day to day with the restaurants anymore. I have this, this business, but um, I work all the time still. Partly because, you know, it's, you know, we're still, you know, somewhat of a, of a, of a younger business and, um, and I just have that same kind of maniacal kind of approach. And my, I, I had a, uh, a therapy session last week and, uh, it was a new therapist. Um, and it was the first time, you know, she was asking these questions and I've always thought like, you know, like, why do I always work so hard? Why am I always like do, doing more things? And I always thought it's because I have this sort of, you know, crazy ambition, which, you know, we do, right? But she's like, sounds like you're like running away from something really painful. <laughs> I wonder how many of you us that do this are actually doing that, are actually <laughs> running away from something, you know, from like our childhood that was really painful. I mean, your dad and mom, I'm sure, like, you know, that's not easy immigrating to like a new country. I mean, maybe, maybe they were, who, who knows? But um, I ask myself often, like, why would I work like this? <laughs> You know, I don't necessarily need to, but I don't know if you, if you, if you have the same thoughts sometimes. I mean, I, I feel like there's, def yeah, there's probably something that happened to me at some point in my life that made me want to, I just, I can never stop trying to improve things. I, I don't, I think that's a good thing and that's a bad thing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can't not have it if we're, especially for what you do and, and for a lot of things. All right. So. I'll, I'll, we'll diverge from that for a minute uh, <laughs> okay. because I want to start talking about some, some sushi things because yeah. I, I have like a million questions, but uh, your dad is like some, as a master at uh, domagiyaki. Yeah. Uh, he's, for he's, people listening, everybody probably knows what it is. You know, the, the cooked egg that you, that you grill, but like what, what makes a great domagiyaki? Like, how do you, how do you make sure that it's great? Like, what are the things that like most of us probably don't know that um, other than like, of course, you need to make it a million times over the course of your life to like perfect it. <laughs> what are things that we don't know about making a tamagiyaki um, that we probably should know? Well, we use dashi in ours. So there's, there's several different versions and some people use like some, some are more like a cake version or they use like shrimp paste or flour paste or um, I'm sorry, fish paste that they kind of put in a mortar and mix it up. Um, but we use the dashi version. That's, that's the one I grew up eating, but I mean, you kind of hit the nail on the head. The, the main thing to get really good at it is doing it over and over and over again every day. Um, my dad is a hundred times better than me because he still does it every day. Um, you need the tam tamagoyaki square copper pan. That's really important too, just for heat distribution. And you need to regulate your heat when you're doing it because um, you can't, you don't want to brown the egg, but at the same time it needs to cook and you're essentially flipping it into layers and you need a lot of oil also to do this. Um, but the main, what kind of oil do you use? Just regular, you just mix oil. oil. Yeah. Blended oil. Yeah. Um, the main thing is just doing it all the time. It's that motion. It's that flipping motion. That's really hard. It's to flip it on itself. Yeah. You get a really clean layers and that perfect, like rectangular shape. Yeah. It's just that motion and you just have to do it a lot. And the, the, the dashi that you use, are you using like a karabushi or like a, like what, what type of um, katsuboshi are you using to make the dashi? Yeah. Yeah. There's anchovies in there. There's, you know, we use kombu and yeah. Oh, that's what we use anchovies. for the whole restaurant. Yeah. Whoa. That's cool. <laughs> you use anchovies in all your dashi? Almost all of it. Yeah. Wow. That's cool. That feels like, like, I thought that was more of like a Korean thing than a Japanese. No, it's, 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 we use it. Yeah. It has that's more cool. flavor. Um, not, not all dashi. I mean, like some of my sauces, like the, um, it's just the, uh, katsubushi and the kombu. 
but yeah, like for yeah. the for like making the soups and stuff, there's there's some anchovy mixed in some yeah. mushrooms. So yeah, yeah. I um last last year I had the guys from Japanese Pantry on the show, oh, no. and I've been buying like the liquid shiokoji from them for a long time. I don't know if you if you ever used it, it's it's amazing. It's like the only place you can get this liquid shiokoji. Yeah, shiokoji is a uh, flavor. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The liquid stuff is great because I just put it in like I put it in eggs. I put it oh, in yeah. you know sauces. It's like a um, cheat code. Yeah, yeah. But um, <laughs> they they were sort of like uh, going. I, I didn't know nearly enough about katsubushi then until like I they started telling me that there's like. There's there's the smoked one. There's the smoked and fermented. You know the arabushi and katabushi, and they're very different. And so then I of course I bought like all these different kinds of katsubushi to make dashi, and I'm like, yeah. holy shit, yeah, they're they're completely different. Like the flavor profiles uh, are like totally different, and like the one that you would use to make like a chawanmushi is totally different from the one you'd use to make like a miso soup. Um, and I had yeah, I had no idea. Which is something I love about Japanese cuisine is there's not a lot of products but the products that they have they go really really deep into <laughs> yeah they go yeah there's a lot of options yeah well i had some questions for you about that so like uh soy sauce um my i, I always i always remember my first uh great sushi meal ever which was this was in like 2005 like after we, we were working at cafe gray and, we, and and once in a while we'd go to this place called sushi seki in new york oh, yeah yeah i never and, went um, there they were open late night right yeah, yeah. Well, they and they ended up, they ended up opening another one on Twenty Third Street, but Seki, um, the first one was uptown, and Seki would be there. And um, I just remember the first time he handed me this spicy scallop roll, and uh, or like the, the the hand roll, you know. Yeah. And it was the best, probably one of the best things I've ever eaten. And um, I never had somebody do that. I didn't know anything about omakase. This was like you know, I was like twenty one. Um, and the other thing that I always remember is like every every course, it would tell us. Soy sauce or no soy sauce? Like, don't use soy sauce or use soy sauce. Yeah, and um, and then sometimes they would swap the soy sauce. And um, I I was curious, like, do you have a particular soy sauce that you like or that you use that you give your guests for um what they're yeah. doing in the sushi? I mean, most sushi chefs we use something called like nikiri shoyu. It's the it means like sweeter soy sauce, but we it's it's augmented. So I get like a base. I use Yamasa for everything. For like that's the brand I like. Yep. Um, and you can get different kinds of soy sauce from them. So I use one that's not as, it's not necessarily less sodium, but it's not as like salty. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I add, I add like mirin and sake and other things. Too. Oh, interesting. So that's the thing that they're dipping should. in. Gotcha. Yeah. That's why when you kind of look at sushi at my sushi, you can always tell if like, it's, it's just like straight soy sauce. Cause it gets really dark. If you, yeah. Yeah. Where it's like kind of like a, this, like it looks a little glazed, like a glistening. That's that's Nikiri show you. Yeah. Oh, okay. So that's, the, that's the secret sauce. All right. So you just make, you make like a, it's almost like a marinade, right? So it's mirin. I mean, you can add other things, but usually it's like a, a mixture of yeah. other things mixed in. Yeah. Um, and then how about for the, for the, for the marinade, the rice, the chorizo is what it's called, right? The charizu, yeah. yeah. What, like what kind of vinegar do you use? For that? I use akazu. So it's red rice vinegar. Um, it, it it's like made with sake leaves, so it just, it just takes a lot longer. It's more expensive, but it has this like umami rich flavor to it. Mm -hmm. Um, that's why you see some sushi rice that's a little brown. Yeah, yeah. That's that's the difference. Um, and then I I also use for the izakaya we use just regular rice vinegar. We use miskan. Yeah, um, yeah. But that's also mixed with like salt, sugar, and some other things. Sometimes it depends on the recipe. I, yeah. I have different recipes for different like seasons or different if it's for the izakaya or it's for the omakase. Oh, interesting. Uh, yeah. So so for the omakase, when you're making um the uh the marinade, the chorizo, like do you do you heat the uh, the vinegar with the salt and sugar? I used to do that and my dad used to do that, but these days I don't I don't heat it up anymore. Yeah. I actually just I actually just mix it all together. You just let it dissolve. I let it yeah, dissolve. It, it, it definitely the, loses the mixing some acid. kinda I felt like it sometimes takes away some of the pungency of the vinegar. That's, yeah, 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 yeah. You lose some of the acid. Do you put? Do you have any kombu in there when you're when you're letting it like sit? I do add a little kombu for like a day, and then you take. If you let it sit too long, it gets sticky. Yeah, yeah, cool. Any 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 preference on on sesame oils, toasted, non toasted, or the types that you like? Yeah, I I used um the what's the brand? Uh, you know, I've used this for so long. <laughs> I don't even look at it. It's in the metal tin. Kadoya? Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. You've probably seen it. It's always in that yeah, little yeah, tin. Yeah. Like yeah. that is that is the sesame oil. Every I think sushi restaurant uses or every Japanese restaurant uses. It, it's like my whole life I grew up with that. I think I have one in my apartment too. <laughs> um, it, yeah, I, I, uh, yeah, that's like that's the one I always have in my house as well. Um, I, I tried this golden sesame oil. Um, it comes from Osaka. Forget the producer's name. Um, but it comes from that that same company, uh, Japanese Pantry. Uh, now I feel like I'm just shouting out this company all the time. But. I'll have to look them up. I don't. I, <laughs> oh, you should definitely familiar. check out. Yeah, a uh, Wataman is the uh, is the company. Um, it's amazing, man. It's the best. I mean, they have a golden sesame oil, they have a toasted sesame oil, and they have a um, uh, a white sesame oil, and um, they also have the sesame paste, which is kind of like tahini, but like way better. And they have a black sesame paste. Yeah. It's insane. Um, and this yeah, this company Wataman is really cool. They're out of they're out of Osaka. Um, I'll shoot you. Um, I'll, I'll shoot you a, a note with a, a link to the um, to the website. And if you ever want to chat with them, are they like Chris a distributor? Like MTC? yeah, they're out of San Francisco. Um, it's Chris, these guys, Chris and Greg, and um, Greg actually had a restaurant, a, San, a, a restaurant, a Japanese restaurant in, in San Francisco, and um, they spend a lot of time going back and forth to Japan, and they just have like like amazing products. I'll have to um, check it out. Definitely. Yeah, not not cheap, but but I mean, actually, some of it actually is pretty, pretty affordable, but um, but really, really good. Yeah. Um, I st- so I, I've read something when you were talking about uni, and like you're like tasting the uni. Um, I love uni; it's like one of my favorite things. But like, I was I curious if you have preference. I get, I get all the unis. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do, do you do you have a preference of like Maine or Santa Barbara or Japanese and 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 um and and also like you said I I saw something where like you taste it every day. Like what? what oh yeah. So when I worked at my dad's restaurant, I we used to do live uni Thursdays because that's when it would come in. Uh-huh. Um, from, it came in live? Yeah, from Santa Barbara. Um, and I had to open, I had to open them all and I had to taste them all because at that time about like a quarter or a third were throwaway. They were just mm-hmm. like either really bitter or floral or the texture yep. was just really broken. You don't know until you open it. Yeah. Um, so I... Once you taste it every day, you start to you start to build patterns. I mean, uni that's going to taste good is usually like really vibrant yellow or orange, preferably like golden orange. That probably means it's going to be sweet. And then the texture shouldn't look, it should look like puffed up, like yeah. bouncy almost. If it looks a little like loose, it's probably not going to be a great texture in your mouth. Um, but if it's, if it's um, like pale, that generally indicates it's going to be bitter. It's not all the time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I had to taste it every day for a long time, the live uni. But that was that was from California. Uh, my favorite uni that I like to use is Aka uni. It's a red uni from uh, Kyushu, from southern Japan. Uh, it, it, to me, it just has like a, a more layered flavor. It's not it's not quite as sweet as like Hokkaido or mm-hmm. Murasaki. Murasaki uni is the purple uni and Hokkaido uni is usually bafun uni, which is like black. It's a black sea urchin yep. and Aka is red. Um, so there's like three main Japanese uni. Um, we, for the most part, use the bafun Hokkaido uni the most. It's yeah. the most consistent, sweetest. Um, you can always get it. Uh, in terms of Maine or California, I've had really good product from both parts more so California, but I don't use either because it's just inconsistent to get mm-hmm. and I need it for my menu. So if I get a batch, that's like really bitter, really broken yeah. or really like, really like wet, I just can't use it. And then my menu is like screwed up that whole week. So I always get the Japanese uni. I'll just pay more for consistency quality. hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. When you get the live, when you were getting the live uni back in the day, like, would you, would you then cure it? No, we would anything? serve it that night. That's why it was live uni Thursdays. But yeah. um, uh, you can, there is, they sell something. I, f- I forget because I haven't used it since my dad's restaurant. I think it's an agar. It's like these little agar gel things that you put mm-hmm. in water. And if you put the uni in it, it puffs it up and it yeah. like holds it so it doesn't melt. And I think most uni you get has actually been treated that way. Yeah. 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 yeah that's why I, I have terrible memories of like, this was like 20 something years ago. I worked at Oceana and we would have those like, you know, the things that you use that cut open the uni. Um, what were you using? Like, uh, I, it's <laughs> I just like used it was a, <laughs> no, yeah, this thing. It was like a. It looked like, like it looked like a pair of scissors, but it but it was like uh, you you um, use it with two hands and you would just like cut it open like that. Yeah. And now I have to Google because 
<laughs> I distinctly remember this thing and I, and I hated opening the uni, but I also like, I, I remember so like vividly, like liking the trays of uni way better than this live uni. Cause the live uni would go on the, uh, on the, like on the, you know, the seafood platters. It just didn't taste the same. I was like, why is it like, it felt like almost like, you know, when you get cod and you have to kind of salt it a little bit or some fish where you have to like salt a little bit to sort of take yeah. out some of the moisture. It just felt like it wasn't as, as tight. I hated opening that stuff. Um, yeah, it's like so, melting. It's like melting in room temp. Yeah. Now I have to look up these <laughs> uni, uni openers. I'm like Googling it right now. <laughs> but you know, these days yeah. it's really hard to do live uni because it's more than half end up being throwaway. So I, I haven't done it for years because the yield is just bad and it's so terrible. Yeah. Uh, well, speaking of that, I, I am also like super curious about, um, am I crazy? Because I'm not Googling this and I can't find, I can't find it anywhere. Uni shears? Um, I'm gonna have to lose up again, but anyways, um, there, like, how do you manage all this, like the waste in a sushi restaurant? You're getting fish in, flown in, uh, for you in particular, uh, it, it, obviously like, like many restaurants, you're getting stuff flown in from, from Japan, I assume. And, um, so you're getting fish in whatever, if it's every day, every couple of days, uh, and you're making a bunch of rice. I think you make like 60 pounds of rice a day. Like, how do you, how do you manage the waste? I mean, I know, you know, how many people are coming in every day. So is that how you do that? Is you, you're very particular about like the weight of every single fish that comes in and you know that's exactly how much we'll need? Yeah, I mean, for the ordering, if you look at my order list, I do try to specify weight. They can't always give me the weight I want for a fish, but I know relatively like, you know, this fish is a, this notoguro is like a pound, a pound and a quarter or, you know, um, so I, you can specify weight. Uh, that's one thing. And quantity. I know how many fish I need for the omakase every night. Uh, but there, there is going to be waste. And that's why having the izakaya is like paramount for this, like this duality. We, we, um, we use all the, any, any fish I don't use, I use in the izakaya and any yeah. fish we have left over at the end of the night from the izakaya, we use in the industry chirashi bowl that's available for takeout, which is like scraps of like scraps. That's awesome a fish put into a pine container with rice, like pickled jalapenos, soy sauce, sesame oil, scallion. Yeah. And like spicy cod roe. And that's like served for $20. We sell for that's 20 so cool. Bucks. And there's like, if you actually count what's in it, it should be worth like $35, $40. Yeah. yeah. And so that's like the next day, like lunch people can get like coming in. It, it's get not lunch. lunch. It's just takeout, but it's all yeah. like, yeah, it's available as long as we have the, the product to use it, but it's, it's any, yeah, fish left over from the day before or just scrap pieces, like end pieces, imperfect pieces. Because for the chirashi sashimi and omakase, we're using all prime cuts. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, sushi is a pretty, um, like, precious craft. You know, I think that uh, from, from an outsider looking in, it seems like it's one of those things that, um, you know, the technique and the time spent um, is really important to assessing like a, a sushi joint. And a lot of these, especially once you get like the like upper echelon of, of omakase, you know, like the, there's um, one, there's almost like this, uh, just like this similarity of all of them, right? They're all, it's, 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 a, it's somewhat of a similar experience, but yeah. they also like have a very particular uh, um, perception of what good sushi is supposed to be. Like, I'm curious, you like, you know, American born, um, obviously spent a lot of time in, 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 a, in a sushi joint, um, and are doing your own amakase now. Like, I'm just curious if like, you feel like this tension between like classical techniques and a modern approach to omakase. Um, and like, do you deal with this ever? Does this ever like become part of your, um, world where you have to sort of deal with this, this tension? Yeah, definitely. No, I, uh, that is, that is my world. I mean, I'm always dealing with this, what is traditional, what is like contemporary, what is untraditional. Like, I'm glad we don't really throw around the word fusion anymore. <laughs> I feel like we've kind of, the food role has kind of grown out of that because it's, it's, it's worldly. We we're using techniques in food from all over the world. Everyone yeah. is, um, as long as it's not done in a tacky way. So yeah, I'm American born. My mom is Korean. I grew up eating Japanese and Korean food. My parents owned a Japanese restaurant and my dad was a celebrated Japanese sushi chef. 
Um, so I have all these parts that make me and my food what it is. Uh, and for a long time, I, I try to stick to pretty traditional sushi and the experience of what you would kind of get at most places. But I would say in the last couple of years, especially in the last year, I have kind of diverged and there's definitely some more integration from just my experience growing up and just from like world travels. Um, it's, I, I can't necessarily call it traditional omakase anymore because it's not, yeah. but it's, I still retain the elements that like make it a good omakase. The, the rice has to be really good and <laughs> the fish has to be really good. I mean, obviously it's, it's mostly about the rice. Yeah. I mean, that is what sushi is about. So that as long as I got that, I feel like I can, you know, the smaller plates are composed dishes. I can kind of have some more fun with as long as it's seemingly Japanese or it like retains a Japanese yeah. feeling and the ingredients or the approach to it. Yeah. What changed? So like you said all of a sudden you, not all of a sudden, it probably was gradual, but like something changed. You're like, okay, now I want to diverge and I'm going to start doing more of what I think. What, 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 ha was there some impetus or the catalyst that was like, helped you make that move? Yeah. I mean, it was, it was a big thing because before, before I made a big change before like last year at, at most, there's like one, maybe one composed plate at most on the menu and then all nigiri and like a tamaki, a hand roll. Um, and it, it, it I have so many regulars and people looking to come in. They're so used to that formula and that is a safe formula, right? And once you start doing composed plates, um, people expect those to change more rapidly than nigiri. Nigiri, yeah. like I could honestly serve the same nigiri. If you go to a sushi restaurant or a sushi omakase and it's all nigiri, like you can get the same pieces forever and you'll be happy because nigiri is a perfect, it's perfect food. It's a perfect bite of food if, if done mm -hmm. really well. As long as you eat it on time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got to eat it quickly one bite. <laughs> Yeah, I would say like last fall, I mean, I started getting some of the best rice I've worked with my rice technique. I I'm like, I'm happier than ever. You know, it's, you're never, you never stop trying to tweak it, but I, I feel like I, I'm very confident in making really good rice and I'm using really great vinegars and like, I'm super confident with all the fish I get and how I source it and how I now I'm dry aging tuna and things like that. So the nigiri, like in terms of creativity, you can only do so much. You can't, when you layer things too far, like too many things on top or too many things underneath, it, it just, yeah. it diverges from what nigiri is, right? I mean, at the end of the day, it's fish, rice, soy sauce, and maybe one or two toppings if at most. But once you do too many, like that's not, that's, it's just so far out what sushi is. And it's a very, like we said, it's a perfect bite. So that kind of pushed me to start putting out some more composed plates just to have more fun and to also change the experience for my diners. Um, and yeah, to like, to just kind of integrate some of my other experiences. Like yeah. I had this, um, uh, I had this bibimbap dish on the menu last, like last season. I mean, it was very Japanese, but it also felt kind of Korean, but I grew up eating that. Like, and you can't do that with a piece of nigiri. Yeah, <laughs> you need no. you need to do a dish like that. Um, it sounds we, like confidence was a big piece of what changed it, which makes a ton of sense, right? You have to you have to master something before you can, you know, think about changing it. You know, you have to understand how to make the perfect mother sauce before you decide to you know make your own version of it. Um, so it seems like maybe you just you hit a uh, an arc in your you know, in your career where you, you felt confident enough, like, okay, I, I, I feel good enough about all this that I can start to, you know, iterate a bit. I think that's a good way of putting it. And also that I, I was, um, I'm three and a half years sober now. I know probably we might talk about that a bit today. And like, I feel like that arc of sobriety and how much I've changed since that point has also contributed to just me just being more comfortable with who I am and who I can put myself what I put on a plate is me, right? It's because yeah. pre-COVID, I got to be honest with you, I was very, I was much more obsessed about just being very Japanese. Mm -hmm. Like just my appearance and the way I marketed myself. Like I am half Korean and I am, I am American born. And, and yeah, my dad is very Japanese and he taught me everything I know, but that's not exactly who I am. 
Um, so, you know, since that point, three and a half years ago, there's been a whole kind of regrowth, I feel like, of just yeah. like understanding who I am. And that comes out in my food, obviously. Yeah. And what's, it's also probably, not probably, I'm sure, a huge part of why your food continues to get more compelling and better uh, because you have your, you know, you know, your perspective on it. It's, 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 sushi is one of those things like there, and there are other like parts of cuisine that are similar to this, where once you get to the best of the best of a nigiri and a perfect bite of nigiri of the yellowtail, you know, that's, that's that. But, and then what, like, what's the difference between, you know, and, and I'm, by the way, this might be a terrible thing to say, but like, what's the difference between masas and narisawas? I don't, are they, are they the same nigiri, piece of nigiri? And is there some tiny little divergence that most people might not pick up, you know? So, you, so with things like this, I feel like it's such a huge advantage as well to just have some other completely different, you know, perspective that you can bring to this. Um, because otherwise it's just the same thing for generations. Yeah. I mean, that is what made Nobu who he is. Yeah. I mean, I'm not trying to be, be Nobu and you know, own hotels in like, I don't know, over 25 restaurants across the world. I'm not, that's not. Well, not yet. You know, you know, you're still <laughs> young, man. <laughs> but he, he has so much Peruvian South American influence in his food. Yeah. And like Japanese food traditionally has no heat. There's no like jalapeno or serrano pepper or ají amarillo. There's no spices. It's just wasabi and maybe like spicy mustard, right? There's yeah. there's no and um uh what's the, uh yuzu kosho. That that's like the spiciest thing you're going to get, right? But I love yuzu kosho. I do. Too. It's also another <laughs> cheat code. But Nobu, Nobu san, like he teach, he completely changed it and yeah. they go so well together, those flavors. Now everyone uses Japanese flavors, right? I mean, dashi is in everything. Mm -hmm. Sh Shokoji is in everything, right? It's, um, so it's exciting. It's exciting to kind of diverge. Um, but I do, you have to pay respect to the chefs who have, they, the traditionalists who have just like, nonstop try to obtain perfection. Perfection is not a real thing. I don't think, I don't think it's a, an actual real thing. It's something that you always aspire to. And that's yeah, what's the pursuit. interesting. Yeah. And I, you know, I think what, look, th that is a beautiful thing too. You know, someone who just like, is just maniacally focused on con continually making that thing better. And this, the tiniest nuances and they compound over time, over the course of 30, 40 years, if you make, you know, a 0.1% improvement in the rice over the course of 40 years, that's a, you know, you can have some pretty incredible rice. And I think that's a beautiful thing too. But it's also just necessary to have other approaches, right? That you have other diverging ways of, of, of eating this food. Otherwise, it, to be honest, it gets a little boring, right? And you can only have so many places that are that, are that you know? For me, yeah, for me, it, was, it's, it, it gets boring. But, you know, obviously that works. Those sushi restaurants are still really busy, still really hard to get into and still really expensive. And it's if so I delicious. stayed on that path, it, I could have been the same, but you know, yeah. it's just, just, this is my journey and this is where it's going. And I just find it a little more exciting for myself. Um, yeah. What do you think are some of like the biggest misconceptions about sushi in America? The biggest one is fresh is best. That is, that's still the biggest one. Um, yeah, just not understanding that like when you freeze freeze a piece of fish on the boat, it's going to be far better than if you catch it and then <laughs> wait no, a day. No, no, not necessarily that. It's more about the aging process. Like you can... Ah, uh, yeah, gotcha. You can age a fish. Like mm -hmm. I dry age my fish, my tuna up to five weeks and it only makes it better. And yeah, it's, it's, as a chef, it's so interesting. Um, and then in, even in Japan at the high, at the like, the peak of omakase chefs, they they tend to age their fish a bit. It's not mm -hmm. it's not it's not just like picked up and cut and served that day. The top ones age a, age a little. Yeah, and those what's, top what's chefs, if you read their like like Jiro, he'll say like on day five, this is when I serve my shimaji or so, something like that. Those nuances. Um, so it's interesting, and and in here in America, it's it's most people just think like, and most of the world they think it's like, oh yeah, it's caught flown over, cut up, served. But that's not yeah. necessarily the best. It is very good. I mean, and it's definitely, it leaves a lot less room for error, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's not the best.
What's the guy's name? I saw this guy do a demo uh, at the Chef's Roll Conference, uh, the Anticon, um, and he did this demo on dried fish. I think he's based in LA, or maybe he's based in. Oh, Leeway. You know what I'm yeah. talking about? Yeah, yeah. Joint seafood. The joint. Yeah. What's right? what's his name? Leeway. Right? Um, I don't I have to I look up his name. Yeah, 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 yeah. I met him. Um, I hung out with him. It was awesome. Yeah. He, um, oh, he's. I went to LA, and he he like he cut me up a bunch of. Tuna and salmon and like sea bream. It was and, so good. Oh, it's delicious. He's like, yeah, yeah, this is three weeks. This is four weeks. That's a hard operation, by the way, like dry aging to then sell to the restaurants because the timing yeah. of all of that, you know, yeah, um, that was what I, to be honest with you, that's what I found most fascinating. I mean, the fish was insanely delicious, but like his process of how he times everything that comes in of when it's going to get to a customer and like the levers he has to pull, like which things age at which point. And, um, you know, cause he, you know, he, he ages everything. So it, it can't just come in and sell it. He's got to, you know, time that's that awesome. really well. And, uh, that's a, that's a hard business. You should have him on the show. He, I mean, he's so knowledgeable about that. And his, his business is, is I, I went there. I mean, it's, it's pretty impressive. Yeah. Yeah. It's <laughs> pretty point. impressive. Will, yeah. Um, well, let's, you know, if you don't mind, I do want to talk a little bit about, about the sobriety because, um, sure, you know, yeah. I know it, I know it started to sort of, um, hit a peak, um, you know, a few years ago and I mean, I, you know, that has been super tough. I mean, COVID, I, I have to imagine had a big impact on, on that. Um, yeah. That was definitely a catalyst. Yeah. Or the, so, the effects of COVID. Before we get into that, I'm just curious now because, um, clearly like drinking helps like to manage stress and all the stress of the restaurant and the COVID or not having a restaurant or whatever yeah. those things are. Um, a big part of, uh, I'm, and I'm speculating here, but like, um, of like getting sober is you have to find some other way to manage that stress. Uh, yeah. Is there something that you do today that sort of replaced the drinking? <laughs> well, I, I mean, I would say therapy is huge just for a foundation. You need therapy. Um, I think everyone could use it. Yeah just makes life better. Um, but after, after doing a lot of therapy, after, so after, um, finding sobriety, honestly, I, yeah, I work out and I work out like that's my hobby when I'm not working like in the morning or I hang out with my girlfriend and we go out eat or do something. But the best way I've found to manage and deal with stress is just, is managing it. It's like actually managing it and being on top of it like the thing the stresses in your life that you're anxious about i don't want to be anxious about it i i i need to address it and that's really hard sometimes and you know most people want to numb that and they just want to drink or get high or something to just like kind of alleviate that right you don't want to face the thing that's causing the stress that is causing you to drink more or like want to go party um so when that was when that was removed from me, I, I have to, I had to start addressing things. Yeah. And that is how I manage it. I, uh, you know, I, I have more sit downs with people if I need to, or, you know, I just try to keep communication open much better. Um, and I like, yeah, I just, I just try to also personally live my life better. So I don't like, call same yeah. problems. I don't have to apologize for anything or, you know. Well, it's, it's, it, that's what it's, 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 um, it's a big part of why I asked that because I've seen people that, you know, they stop doing drugs or drinking and then they're just like maniacally in the exercise and they exercise like, you know, three hours a day, every day or into some other thing. And yeah. it's better in that, yeah, you're doing something that's healthier than drinking, but it's such a great point that you make that yeah, the only way to really, to, 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 to have a healthy way to manage the stress is to actually make space for it and talk about it and be in it, which I'm terrible at, by the way, that's why I, you know, like trying to, you know, work, work with therapists on them because they're like, yeah, like it's probably why you work all the time and then exercise <laughs> because all those things mean you don't have to deal with like what you're thinking. And I think that's probably why you it's so sustainable the way you're approaching sobriety because you're, you have a therapist and you are like, you know, you didn't find some other like, yeah, um, another replacement. Ism. Yeah. The isms. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm public about this, so I don't mind saying it. I, I, I go to AA. I mean, AA has been a huge part and like, 
I never thought I'd, I'd go to something like that. Right. Cause they're usually in churches and I'm not a religious person, but, uh-huh. uh, I have to, I have to admit, like, it, it, it just teaches you how to live life better. Like just how to deal with resentments, how to deal with, um, it's, it's, it's mainly dealing with resentment. Yeah. A lot of it, a ton of it, <laughs> yeah. or just being upset at someone or yourself. And how yeah. do you deal with that? And the best way to deal with it actually is to like, you address it. Yeah. So true, man. It's the only way, right? You got to problem with way someone, too. you should talk about it. Yeah. And what I found in the past three years is the situations that I thought were going to be so explosive, like just like, oh my God, the world's going to end if I have this conversation with X person or Y person. 99% of the time, that doesn't happen. That scenario, yeah. everything's fine. If anything, yeah. it's better. Or you decide to like part ways, whatever. But uh, that's it. It never it like explodes. It's not like you're arguing and yelling at each other. No, it's like you're just having conversation. No, no I mean, that's feel, also I, on you. Like you have to also, you know, <laughs> know how to tame yourself and your temper. But the best way to do it is just, just if you got a problem or you're feeling something, you should communicate that. That's it. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. It's why I, I, I think I just, I mentioned this too often now, but I have this, uh, picture frame back there. Oh, from what's Seneca. The, what does it say? Uh, Seneca's a, like a stoic philosopher. And I, I love this quote. I have it in as many places as possible. Um, and it basically just says we suffer more in imagination than reality. Yeah. And it's exactly what you just said, right? There's, we, we, we create so much, uh, of this stress and anxiety in our heads. And then that creates more stress and then that creates more. And um, yeah, when you think about it, when you like play the thing out, you're like, "Mm, it's not that, this isn't that big of a thing. You know, we just need to talk about it. I do think you're, you like, it's awesome that you, that you see a therapist. And I totally agree. Like everybody should, because it's just to address these problems, you, you know, you just need to make space for them. And a therapist is just someone you pay to make space for talking about your problems. You yeah. have your friends for that too. You kind of don't want to do it with your wife or your girlfriend because there's a bias there and you can, but there's, you know, you know, any, any, anytime there's like some real, like, you know, bias because of the relationship, it's tough. Um, so like, you're just basically paying somebody to make space for the shit that you want to <laughs> deal with. Well, so I agree. Everybody should. Definitely. But also what you're doing is, I mean, I, like I, I'll complain to my friends sometime if I need to or vent or, or my girlfriend, but there's some things that aren't for them. Right. Yeah. And you went by, you should tell them what's bothering you, but you can't expect them to find you a solution and that puts it on them. And someone who is professionally trained and has the experience of dealing with so many situations from other people and seeing how it plays out, just like you and I have worked in kitchens and we know the situations, how it plays out. Like they know it well on just how someone having a mental breakdown or <laughs> uh, like yeah. this, this stress in life, how it may play out. So that's what I think is critical is like having that professional who you can tell anyone and they can't tell anybody, right? They, they're not allowed to tell anybody. You can tell them anything and they can help you or at least they can listen to you and not be annoyed that they have to listen to you, right? Yeah, Some, exactly. Sometimes it, it can be annoying if, if you have- I'm sure they're annoyed sometimes, but the, you know, that's what they're paid for. But no, no, I mean, it, like, if, if you're, like, girlfriend or your wife or you're, like, your oh, friend, yeah. like, if you complain all the time, that gets yeah. annoying. Yeah, of course. Annoying. And it's a burden. On, it's it's a burden that isn't necessarily fair anyways to put on on them all the time. And and uh, and I, that's why I definitely think a therapist is just a great, you know, a great thing for anybody to have for that, for that same reason. And sometimes, honestly, like, just saying the thing. It gives you like 50% of the relief, <laughs> you know, <laughs> having a place where you could just like say the thing. Absolutely. Um, I had a therapist that like a long time ago that I was annoyed about because like I would tell her this problem and I'm like, okay, let's figure out how to solve it. She's like, nah, <laughs> just, just talk about it. I'm like, no, what do you mean? Let's, let's figure out. And she said, no, I just want you to, want you to, to say them today. I'm like, that's, that's dumb, but actually it did help a bunch. So. You got to find the right therapist for you. Cause yeah, yeah. People yeah, like us, like, yeah, we want to solve things, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so um, I was going to ask you, like, what's next for you? It sounds like this restaurant, this new new Izakaya um, is next for you. What, what's like the, um, is that like already in the works? Do you already have the lease signed? Yeah, lease is signed. Um, we announced it publicly, I think three weeks ago, just because the liquor license placard went up for transfer. 
um, which shows our LLC, which is, you know, you can yep. understand, see my name on it. Um, but we're, we're like a year out. It's probably next spring or next summer. Um, how are you feeling about it? I mean, it's so far out where it's almost like not real yet, but it's also, you know, we meet every week or more than once a week about it and we're conceptualizing and designing it. It's, it's very exciting. I am really excited. I feel like this is the right move. It, you know, I, I have had offers for so long, all these years to open more and you usually see people just keep opening right after yeah. they open one, the next year they open two or something. Um, I waited seven or eight years to do, to do this. It just had to be the right move. And yep. Royals at the, at a good place right now in terms of culture and staffing and like, um, experience and systems. systems are huge. So, you know, we can also transfer those systems to a new place. That's a big part of it. Um, so I feel really excited about this. I can't wait. It's also in Rittenhouse, which I live in. I live in center city. Like, I don't know how familiar you are with Philadelphia. But I live like a block and a half from this, where this restaurant Oh, that's awesome. Is. Yeah. And it's in the hub of the city, whereas Royals kind of, it's on Front Street, which, which is First Street <laughs> next to Jersey, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a destination still almost where this is right in the middle. So, yeah. How far um, apart are they from here, <laughs> if you drove? Um, It's like 15 minute drive, 10 minute drive. Yeah. yeah oh, that's not bad at all. Yeah. yeah. It's always tough when the second restaurant's really far away. Yeah, like I, I got offers so like in New York, Boston, DC. I'm like, no, nah, I don't, yeah, I don't want to yeah, jump yeah. on a train or a plane to get to my other restaurant. You have to, you have to be mobile, be able to be there all the time. Yeah, yeah, awesome, man. Well, um, I'm excited for the second opening, though. I'm gonna come to Royals for the first time soon. Um, I didn't realize how close. I mean, it's pretty, pretty quick to get to Philly from New York. Um, I have a lot of take... regulars who just take the train in. Yeah, for their yeah. reservation. <laughs> <laughs> they yeah. go home. You yep. gotta come in. Let me know. Yeah, yeah. Well, but, well, this was um, this was great, man. I appreciate the time, and uh, I know you gotta get back to uh, doing the thing. But I'm glad we got. We, I'm glad we finally found some time for this. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely.